Let's see. Let's wait for some people to jump in. What do you guys want to talk about today? Terry Campoli, Andrew Artiega, the Denise Drake. What's up, Denise? All right. I haven't done one of these in a while where it was just me solo. The last few episodes have been interviews, which are pretty fun. I'm going to talk to Luis Villasenor of Keto Gains last week. That was great. Um, before that, talk to Mike Mutzel of High Intensity Health. He's got a great YouTube channel. So you got, if you guys are into podcasts and nerding out on kind of the deep nitty-gritty aspects of health and wellness and longevity, his channel, High Intensity Health, is pretty awesome. So, uh, yeah, you can check out the interview I did with him like two weeks ago, and uh, Luis was like a week ago, or maybe Luis was two weeks ago. I'm not sure how long it's been, but go ahead and check out those. Um, before that, I talked to Amy Berger. Amy Berger of Tuit, T U I T, nutrition.com. And we talked about all kinds of stuff, got into a lot of the myths and misconceptions about ketogenic and low carbohydrate diets. And that's usually what we end up talking about on these, uh, on these live hangouts because there seems to be a lot of confusion out there on how to properly implement a low-carbohydrate ketogenic diet. Um, one of the most common mistakes being people becoming obsessed with macronutrient ratios, people thinking that you must eat 80% fat to be in ketosis. Now, this is patently untrue. You do not need to eat 80% dietary fat to become ketotic. Ketosis is a state where you are oxidizing fatty acids and turning fats into ketones via the liver um, and using those for energy in most of the body, vital organs, including the brain. Uh, the brain and heart can run quite efficiently off of ketones. It's a very efficient fuel to use. Um, it's also a powerful signaling molecule, beta-hydroxybutyrate and other ketones. Um, oh, we got lots of questions coming in now. What's up, everybody? Evan, Denise, Kevin, Terry. Hello, guys. What's going on? But I'll just stay, say from the start that to a lot of the new individuals who are looking into a ketogenic diet, you have to realize that you do not need to eat an exorbitant amount of fat to get into ketosis. Now, it is a high, a high fat diet. And if you don't have a lot of body fat to burn, if you don't have a lot of body fat to tap into, then your diet might look something like, more like these medical style ketogenic diets that you see recommending 80% fat calorically. Um, so when you get closer to your maintenance weight or if you're even trying to gain weight, if you're plenty lean, you don't need to lose any more body fat like me a few months ago. Got very, very lean. Um, so I increased my fats dramatically because I didn't have any more body fat to tap into. Well, I had plenty of body fat to tap into still, but I didn't have any more that I, any more that I wanted to burn. I didn't want to get any leaner. I was feeling too light. Um, so what happens then is you up your fats. But if the goal is fat loss... Why do you need to be eating 200 grams of fat, people? Energy balance still matters. You'll still be on a diet that you will be burning primarily fat. And you will be burning ketones. You will have high blood ketones, but that does not require you to have 80% fats in your diet. You could eat. Here's just an example of why the macronutrient ratios dogma is so confusing and doesn't really make any sense. You could eat a 100% carbohydrate diet and be in ketosis. What are you talking about, crazy person out there in the middle of nowhere in Ecuador? What the heck are you talking about? You can eat an all-carbohydrate diet and be in ketosis. <laughs> Consider this. Say you're eating one meal a day. Fasted for like 24 hours. Oh, there you go. <laughs> You're going to be in ketosis, likely, especially if you're meaning low carb uh, before that. But you're very likely going to be in ketosis. And say you eat for one meal after fasting for 24 or 48 hours or whatever. Say you eat one meal and it's just some broccoli, maybe like 50 to 100 grams of broccoli. That's all you eat. Now, that is 100% carbohydrate, nearly. I mean, there's a few grams of protein in there. Um, 
but it's mostly fibrous carbohydrate. There's some glucose in there. There's a lot of fiber. Most of that fiber is indigestible. Most of that fiber will not raise your blood glucose, will not turn directly into glucose, and will just be used um, for as a fermentable substrate to feed gut bacteria. Now, you could be eating 100% carbohydrate in that case. One serving of broccoli, one small serving of broccoli, the rest of the day you're fasting, you'll probably be in ketosis, especially if you normally eat a ketogenic diet like I do. So that's just one little example, an extreme example, albeit, of why macronutrient ratios don't always matter. All right. There's so many comments now. What's up, everybody? The Denise Drake says, can you take too much maca? I've never been able to. <laughs> um, yeah, Denise, um, it's non-toxic. You're not going to have, you likely won't have, I mean, you're not going to get any issues from having too much maca, but I mean, yeah, I mean, you can eat too much of anything, right? Can you take too much maca? Um, you know, if you, <laughs> if you take that to the utmost logical extreme, sure you could, but uh, it's unlikely that any human's going to. Uh, the Peruvians up in the Junin Plateau, where our maca is sourced from, the families who actually have been working with this plant for hundreds of years, whose ancestors depended on this plant to actually have help them survive in the Andes of Ecuador, Peru, of Bolivia. These individuals eat lots of maca. They make maca wine. They make maca liquors. They make breads out of maca. They do pretty every single meal these people eat. They're consuming maca in the Junin Plateau. It's everywhere. It's one of their main, it's their main staple crop. It's the main source of income. But it's also very, very important for them culturally because it allows them to survive at this high altitude environment. Um, you can eat quite a bit of maca and be fine, though. So I'm probably not going to have to worry about it. <laughs> Thoughts on nootropics, says Evan. HRT, question mark, says Evan. Uh, what's up, Evan? Nootropics. Very popular word right now. Um, that's, that's such a wide, it's a broad question. I mean, which nootropics in particular would you like to hear my opinion about? There's so many of them. Um, you know, you've got the basic racetam family, uh, things like nuopept. Um, there's, there's so many <laughs> nootropics out there. There's all these new research drugs that people are taking. Um, I don't mess with them much. Uh, I'll say that I've tried paracetam, got like a bag of bulk paracetam somewhere in my kitchen. Um, aniracetam, a few of these other racetams, and uh, yeah, they're all right. I prefer, I actually prefer natural compounds. Not that, not just out of dogma, but just because the ones that I've found work for me, like lion's mane mushroom, for instance, bacopa, mucuna. Um, I mean, Makuna's got high levels of dopa. A lot of these people who are on like longevity forums um, and stuff like that have experimented with these things as well. I find I get better results from that, from things like reishi mushroom, shaga mushroom, from dietary and lifestyle habits um, to actually boost cognition, to actually boost brain power, boost mood, and um, you know, decrease inflammation and all that stuff. I prefer these natural compounds, and I find that I get better results from them. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. I just, I'm wary of a lot of these nootropics. Um, yeah, so I mean like paracetam, stuff like this. They've been used for a long time. And it's obvious that there are some benefits to these things. Hey, Ariana. Good morning. Ariana just woke up from a nap. Hobbling through the room. My concern with these is, you know, long-term safety stuff studies on humans not really available a lot of literature on this stuff a lot of these compounds come out of of uh of russia of the russian pharmaceutical industry not that that's a bad thing I, i'm not trying to lump that in there uh, although i guess if you if you watch enough um television you're afraid of everything behind the behind every cupboard and door and you think the russians are out to get you for some reason all this cold war rhetoric ramping up again but uh yeah um, I don't know, man. Evan, that's a that's a deep one. Nothing wrong with them. I just personally, for me, I prefer some of these more natural compounds, um, medicinal mushroom compounds and stuff like that. I think that those are uh, safer, funner, feel cleaner 
than a lot of the Rastams and stuff like that. C color Rastatam is kind of interesting. I'll try that one. I don't know. Not so into them. Zero carb diets. Evan's asking about zero carb diets. Yeah, I don't know. Why? Why zero carb? If it's because you've come on information about low carb diets, and you've reading about you've been reading about ketogenic diets, so then you might think, okay, low carb good, lower carb better. <laughs> uh, if that's the case, then uh, I don't really think it's a good idea. However, some individuals have very good results on these zero carb diets. Um, actually, one of the original guys to promote it was Owsley. Bear Owsley, the bear. Uh, Owsley Stanley, he invented the uh, the wall of sound for the Grateful Dead. He was a sound engineer, all kinds of shady intelligence connections too. Um, supposedly one of the first individuals to, uh, to like synthesize LSD in the United States. Um, very strange guy, very strange connections. But uh, he was one of the original guys talking about the zero carb diet. That's pretty funny. A lot of the zero carb people um, kind of uh, elevate Owsley as their uh, as the guru, the zero carb guru. That, that's kind of an interesting caveat. Not that it has anything to do with the actual substance and content of a zero carb diet. Um, we have to learn to dissociate personality from content. Uh, the internet and mass media love to get us confused about. Um, you get us emotionally triggered by individuals and words, twilight language, and uh, play with the emotions there. I'm not trying to like, discredit um, discredit zero carb by associating it with Owsley. Shoot, I mean, a lot of individuals would think that's awesome. They think uh, Owsley is a really cool character. A lot of people in ca certain counterculture circles, um, especially in the Bay Area, California, and uh, you know, the West Coast, and... Uh, so yeah, anyway, zero carb diets can be useful. Lots of anecdotal evidence of people utilizing them effectively. Um, if you look at my talk with Andrew Scarborough, you can learn a little bit about properly implementing a zero carb diet. He's an individual who had a very aggressive form of cancer and used a zero carb diet or uses a more zero carb diet. And I don't even know if he eats carbs now. He might be including some more some things like avocado and whatnot now. But he found that he was very sensitive to salicylates um, and all kinds of different things um, after his brain tumor. And he used a ketogenic diet, namely a zero-carb diet, like no plant-based foods, to manage his brain chemistry because he would get really intense seizures. And he actually ended up telling me that he found that there seemed to be a higher correlation, a more... Uh, obvious relationship between DHA intake and the level of seafood that he ate, that he ate, um, to lower, the, uh, lower, uh, reduce seizures than ketosis and deeper ketosis. I guess what I'm saying is what Andrew ended up finding was that he believed that DHA levels were more important than blood ketone levels for maintaining his brain chemistry and for, um, keeping that seizure threshold out of his range. So he's not getting seizures all the time. I think that's really interesting. Um, Kevin Jackson says, "What up from the Bay?" What <laughs> up, Kevin Jackson? Kevin Jackson from the Bay knows who Owsley is. <laughs> All right. Hey, I was getting night sweats from keto. Says Bruce Cisneros. They told me it was from my body heating up from protein. <laughs> what? <laughs> night sweats from keto? <sighs> you know, maybe when you're adapting. Uh, and you're going through the uh, so-called keto flu type stuff, uh, you might be getting some reactions like that. I mean, it sounds like some, the gut bacteria changes are happening. There's so many things that are going on with the body. It's definitely not from you eating. Your body He's not heating up from protein when you're sleeping at night. There will be a thermogenic effect from eating protein, but that's not going to last more than like an hour or so or a couple hours after a meal. Um if I'm not mistaken, which I'm always mistaken. I know this is the internet and you're supposed to pretend like you know everything, but uh, look, I'm here trying to learn, trying to grow, trying to help people out and uh, trying to uh, trying to shed my own layers, my own dogma, just like you guys are. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't really know what you're talking about there about the body heating up, Bruce. 
Um, some people find that their core body temperature does increase a little bit, but like intense night sweats for a while. All right. King2559 says, I've started keto, but I don't eat chicken or fish, and I'm taking eggs. Is this okay? Or are you a, are like a vegetarian for some reason? Why don't you eat chicken or fish? Will you eat beef? Because if you're going to try to do a ketogenic diet with eggs being your only source of protein, your only food from the animal kingdom, I would not recommend doing it. Uh, vegetarian, vegan, keto, very difficult. Not saying vegetarian and vegan diets can't be done in a relatively healthy way. Um, I was, I've done a vegan diet. I did it <laughs> for quite a while, actually. Um, almost two years on a mostly vegan diet. Another vegan to say, oh, mostly vegan diet. Yeah, that's because every few months I found that I just had to eat some fish or some meat because uh, I didn't want to go get B12 shots. I thought that was silly. Uh, but it was an experiment. It was interesting. felt great in the beginning. But I did realize that uh, we need animal products. At least I do. Um, I need vitamin B12, as most of the scientific research shows that every human being requires it as well. But, um, yeah, if, if you're just going to eat eggs, I wouldn't say you could go about it. Now, if you're looking for more ideas, if you're looking for a way to broaden your horizons on uh, how to properly implement a ketogenic diet, check out my wife's cookbook. That's like the best piece of advice I give you right there. For the individual asking about zero-carb diet earlier, if you're going to do a zero-carb diet, you better include – copious amounts, well not copious amounts, but you better include some nutrient-dense foods um, like organ meats because you're not going to get all the nutrition you need just from a few steaks a day. It's not going to give you all the micronutrients, all the macronutrients you need. Um, organ meats are a fantastic source of fat-soluble vitamins and other nutrients like heart contains a lot of coenzyme Q10. Liver has got a significant amount of vitamin D, vitamin K2. Um, Vitamin A, rather. Uh, and there's just there's so many benefits to eating and including organ meats in your diet. And there's an entire section on organ meats in our cookbook. My wife worked on this cookbook for like a year. Maybe, I think it was over a year. It might have been like a year and a half. Jessica was slaving away at this cookbook. And it really shows. It really came out incredible. Um, I want to thank everybody for leaving positive reviews. For everybody who's purchased and enjoyed the cookbook, thank you so much. Um, we we really appreciate it. It helps support our channel. It helps support what we do here. Um, we always try to provide you with the best cutting-edge information, what we believe to be the truth. We try to cut through all the BS and share with you how to do both what we're doing and um, and share with you other modalities and other perspectives on how to optimize and maximize your life using things like diet, lifestyle, and um, the healthy implementation of these changes. So if you're looking to uh, broaden your perspective beyond just like those meals with just bacon and eggs, like, oh no, you weren't even eating bacon, you're just talking about eggs because you said you won't eat fish and you won't eat chicken. King2559. If you're looking to broaden your perspective, check out the Ketogenic Edge cookbook. It's only available on our website, primaledgehealth.com. Check that book out. Pretty awesome. Um, in my completely biased opinion because my wife made it, but uh, I mean, it, it was a labor of love. And our whole family was actually working really hard on this one for over a year. Leo from Morocco. What's up, man? Ah. Brian Haley says, I have a question. I was told that I should be on a 60, 35, 5 macros count to lose fat fast. What is your thoughts? What is your thoughts? <laughs> All right. Brian, I was talking a little bit about this earlier, and um, macronutrient ratios are irrelevant to fat loss. Let me tell you why. This is the, what you, the way you worded your question. You said, I got a question. I was told that I should be on 60, 35, 5 macros count to lose fat fast. What is your thoughts? Um, all right, so you're at 65, so you're 60, 35, 5 macro count, right? So what about energy balance? 60, 35, 5, the break being the breakdown of percentages of calories from fat, protein, and carbohydrate. 
you're not even specifying the energy. You're not even specifying how much. Um, I don't want to say it because it's such a weird loaded term because then people think I'm saying that calories in, calories out is all that matters. I'm not saying that calories in, calories out is all that matters, but energy balance does matter. If you're going to be eating 5,000 calories of 60, 35, 5 macros, you're eating indiscriminately and you just think that if you keep your fat high enough, you're somehow going to lose body fat. That's not how it works, unfortunately. For losing body fat, macronutrient ratios are not really relevant. Now, for ketosis, for nutritional ketosis, you're definitely going to want to eat dietary fat. You're going to want to eat sufficient protein, but the macronutrient ratios are going to be different according to your goals, your individual context, and many other things. So get sufficient protein, fat, you will adjust according to your goals. If you have a lot of body fat to lose, you're going to be spending a bulk of your time not consuming, not shooting for 80% fat or worrying about that, but trying to keep your fat within a specific range. So say you find that your protein intake, your optimal protein intake is about, I don't know, 90 grams of protein, for instance. Say you're an individual who needs 90 grams of protein would be sufficient for you. Now, your fats are not going to be calculated based on the percentages. Um, you might need more fats if you're trying to gain weight, if you're trying to maintain weight, if you're trying to lose body fat, like you said, you're not going to want to eat as many fats as an individual who's trying to maintain weight, who's trying to be weight stable. So fats move according to your goals. Set your protein. Find how much protein you need. Get sufficient protein in. Don't go too low on the protein. Don't think that five grams more on protein is going to magically all turn into sugar and ruin your entire diet. That's not how it works either. Yeah, you don't want to eat an, an exorbitant amount of protein. You don't need to eat like 300 grams of protein. That's absurd. But you need to get sufficient protein. I would say don't go below. Even if you're sedentary, never really want to go below one gram per kilogram of your lean body mass and protein. Um, never going to really need of like one gram per pound of lean body mass and protein either. Realize I'm talking about lean body mass too. Lean body mass. That's how you calculate protein intake. So anyways, get sufficient protein. Fats will change according to the goal. Don't get this all, get this out of your head. The dogma about 80% fat, 70% fat, 60% fat. It's not really relevant. Now, if you've got a lot of fat on your body, once you get adapted, now in the beginning, I usually recommend eating at about maintenance calories. So then you will be a little bit higher fat for that first week or so while you're adapting to the diet. But when you can, when your hunger is super low, when your satiety is high and you're feeling good, then you're probably going to want to dial back those fats to make sure you're in a significant enough caloric deficit to burn body fat. If you're eating enough fat on the plate to supply your energy needs for the day, you don't need to tap into body fat, and your body will keep that stored body fat. You don't just burn off body fat magically because you ate a bunch of fat. It's not how it works. And anybody who's telling you otherwise has been misled or is misleading you. Um, so that's what it is. Sufficient protein, fats according to your goal. Carbohydrates, most individuals are going to want to keep those below like 30 grams. Leo from Morocco, what's up? Jordan F., how's it going, man? Says he's a big fan. Why are you a big fan? You be a big fan of me. That's crazy. Leo says, I appreciate the useful advice. Thank you, Leo. Appreciate you hollering up from Morocco, man. Representing Africa, North Africa, South America, joining hands. We are the world. <laughs> Tiki says, shout out from Michigan. What's up, man? How's it going? Jordan says, what foods do you eat to boost cognition and mood? Are they easily available? All right. So anybody who's done the hangouts with me here before has probably heard me talk about maca. I'm really big fan of maca. That's one of my favorite foods for boosting cognition, boosting mood. Um, it's an adaptogen. It's a root that only grows at about 15,000 foot elevation, as low as like 12,000 foot elevation in the Andes. Um, I mean, just that fact alone always trips me out. This... When you go to where maca grows and you feel how harsh it is, how thin the air is, how cold it is, um, 
and you see how intimately these people are tied in with this heritage crop. Um, it's it's just incredible. <laughs> the Spanish actually, when the conquistadors came to the Andes and they came down to uh, Peru, Bolivia, Colombia, Ecuador, to the west coast of South America, they found that their livestock and the animals they brought with them were infertile. They couldn't live in the harsh conditions. First of all, they weren't used to eating the local um, plants. They weren't used to eating and digesting the plants that are here. Um, now, the ecology here has changed a lot since the European came. Um, then we've got eucalyptus trees growing all around the valley here. These are not native. These are from Australia. They actually destroy the soil here, dry it out, and really mess up the, uh, the local ecology. So it is an invasive species. Kind of sucks. But that's a, a, a side note. But their, uh, their livestock, when the Spanish came here, they, wouldn't, they couldn't thrive. Then they started giving them maca. They realized what the natives were doing, that they would give it to uh, individuals who were having fertility issues. They would give it to their llamas when they're having fertility issues, their alpacas. They would give it to other animals, and they suggested to the Spanish, hey, give this stuff to your animals and watch. They'll thrive. And it worked. Um, so, yeah, maca is one of my favorite ones. Uh, lion's mane mushroom, also really powerful. Reishi mushroom. Incredibly powerful. Uh, one of the top herbs in traditional Chinese medicine. Um, I really like reishi and uh, certain reishi extracts I like to play around with. A, uh, the reishi spore oil that we actually have on our website. I don't know if it's in stock right now. Um, but yeah, lion's mane, reishi, cordyceps, um, shaga mushroom, and maca, of course. And I like to mix maca with cacao, uh, with raw chocolate. And I find that maca and cacao synergize incredibly together. Very, very nice. Jackie from St. Louis, how's it going? Clint from Mantor, Ohio, what's up? Jackie says, thoughts on dairy? I think you mean dairy. Thoughts on dairy. All right. I have many thoughts on dairy. <laughs> Opinions, I got many also. Um... So I'll give you some thoughts and opinions on the dairy issue. Dairy, 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 dairy. I've got butter in our fridge. I actually have some raw goat's milk in the fridge right now, too. Um, dairy. The reason that a lot of people say to stay away from dairy. There's many reasons. There's different reasons. And individuals will be against dairy. But, uh... For the average person, it's not going to be too big of a deal. If you're lactose intolerant, obviously you want to avoid dairy at all costs. You want to avoid casein and avoid lactose at all costs if you're intolerant to them. But if you can handle them, you do fine with them. There's nothing wrong. Dairy can be an incredibly um, beneficial thing. Uh, Grass-fed butter can have high levels of vitamin K2, vitamin D as well. Um, you know, raw milk, unpasteurized milk has been used for thousands of years as a heritage food as a potent source of beneficial bacteria um it got you all freaked out the raw milk's got live bacteria in it it's gonna kill you um that's why you want raw milk because it's got the live bacteria it's got the bifidobacteria it's got the lactobacillus it's got this live bacteria that's incredibly beneficial for you now a lot of people are very sensitive to dairy a lot of people are intolerant to dairy and there's two different some other theories on this too like a2 versus a1 cattle a2 cattle being uh, higher in fats and having less of an inflammatory subtype of casein in it. So, so a lot of people find that they do really well on A2 dairy, on raw milk as well, as opposed to pasteurized milk. So many different opinions out there. Dairy is not inherently bad. Uh, I take issue with uh, commercial dairy, with the mass-produced crap, pasteurized um, food from these you know, massive feedlot farms and this, uh, you know, this incredibly destructive industrial agriculture system that has completely um, invaded the, most of the Western world through the consolidation of, um, of the food supply, of the seed supply, and through the lobbying of, uh, of so-called charitable organizations like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, yeah, I mean, this, these people are pushing genetically modified foods that are destroying the heritage crops of the world, destroying the uh, destroying the soil of the planet, and uh, 
you know, most commercial dairies, they're just fed on straight up GMO corn, um, you know, GMO corn and glyphosate soaked wheat products or what most humans on the planet, not even on the planet, most humans in the U S um, glyphosate's use in Europe is much less. Uh, Monsanto is actually not allowed in many other countries in the world. Why do you think that is? I think that is people. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, I, I take issue with commercial dairy, with industrial agriculture in general. It's hard to avoid if you're living in you know urban, suburban areas in the United States. I understand. Uh, as far as health goes, if you're not intolerant to dairy, you can handle it. Now, on a ketogenic diet, it can be really, really easy to eat a lot, a lot of cheese. <laughs> so if you're trying to uh, lose body fat, having just you know indiscriminate amounts of cheese around um, heavy cream and stuff like that might not be beneficial to an individual who's trying to lose body fat because they're hot they're high calorie nutrient dense foods that are very palatable it's easy to eat a lot of them same thing with nuts like it can be so easy to just take down a whole bag of nuts or to eat a whole jar of peanut butter um, but still gotta worry about not worry about still gotta consider energy balance energy balance matters so um yeah, there's a long, multi-angled approach to the dairy issue. Jackie from St. Louis. All right. What are your thoughts on maintaining proper amount of electrolytes? He's having elevated pulse rates. I think it's because electrolyte imbalance. Yeah, all right. So electrolytes. Make sure you're getting enough salt. Salt your food heavily. That's the first one. The first line of defense against electrolyte imbalance is salt, sodium. Good rule of thumb is to have, if you're eating three meals a day, have a teaspoon of salt on each meal. That's a good way to go about it. Easy, simple, straightforward. But you're going to need at least five to seven grams of sodium per day. Most individuals. Some individuals more. If you're sweating a lot, doing saunas, stuff like that. You're going to need more. If you're working outside, sweating again, uh, probably going to need more electrolytes. Magnesium. Many people can benefit from supplementing magnesium because most of the food supply is very depleted in magnesium. Thanks, Ariana. Most of the food supply, the uh, soil is depleted of magnesium because of the heavy use of fertilizers and things like glyphosate that actually chelate the soil of valuable minerals such as magnesium, manganese, and others. So magnesium is important. Um, yeah, might want to supplement with magnesium. I'd say 800 to 1,200 milligrams what I give most individuals, most clients that work with me probably end up on about 800 milligrams of magnesium daily. And there's different sources of magnesium for different reasons. One that's usually good for most individuals is magnesium glycinate. That'll be preferentially used by muscle tissue. Also, potassium, pretty important, but you don't really want to supplement with potassium. Uh, you can use potassium citrate or something like that. Or use no salt, which is uh, potassium chloride. And that can be useful. But um, if you can eat like an avocado a day, Get in a good serving of spinach each day. You should be able to get enough potassium from greens, which will also give you magnesium. I like to boost magnesium intake as well just because so many people are – I think it was like 90% of people in some study. I'm just pulling out the back file <laughs> um, ready to be deleted drawer in my memory. But I think like something like 80 to 90% of people in the U.S. are deficient in magnesium. So, yeah, magnesium is important. Let's see, let's see. Evan says, zero carbs easier for me and more practical. Hey, enjoy it, man. Nothing wrong with zero carb. I don't think it's for everybody. Um, and I think it can attract some uh, people who've got phobias about food. I mean, this is the internet, right? Like, I mean, you see there's so many people, and I talk with them all the time, individuals who've just got some serious hangups about food. Um you know, I mean, I don't like to use the word eating disorder just because it gets thrown around so much, right? But in uh, this other term, uh, what's it called? Phobia. It? Anything with phobia is always funny. It becomes like politicized, right? Like you're phobic. You're pedophile phobic. Like, I don't know. It's like there's weird uses for phobia. But uh, yeah, a lot of people just become. I forget the, the word. Uh, orthorexic. Orthorexia. Like orthorexic about food. I think that carbohydrates, yes, I must lower my carbohydrates. Therefore, lower equals better. Zero carb must be better for me because all carbohydrates are evil. 
you know, I think uh, these extreme reasons for jumping into something like a zero carb diet can be a little disconcerting and uh, yeah, but it sounds like you just, you're doing what works for you and you found that zero carb works for you. I know several other individuals who find that zero carb just feels awesome. They love it and it works. So do what works for you. Don't worry about what other people's dogma is, what other people's belief systems and belief structures are. If they're so concerned with um, <laughs> with what you eat, uh, yeah, they, they must have something going on in their own life that is being uh, overlooked and not examined. So yeah, you enjoy it, Evan. If a zero carb approach is easy and practical, do it. All right, let's see. Leo says zero carb. Where do you get the dietary fiber? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, the fiber issue is not closed for debate. Uh, there's a lot of people that think that yes, fiber is amazing. There's so many different things that fiber does. Um, you know, long short chain fatty acids, and you know the, the fermentation is required for maintaining a healthy gut flora. But there's a lot of anecdotal evidence of individuals. Um, doing zero carb, very low fiber diets, and getting great results. Um, what works for one person won't work for everybody. So maybe, maybe, just maybe, more fiber isn't always more better. Just like because low carb is good, lowest carb isn't necessarily better. You know, we got it's all about balance. It's all about individual context. What works for you? All right. Clint says, I think Eskimos do zero carb and have short lifespans. <laughs> That's a loaded comment. <laughs> I get into that, like all the assumptions made there. All right. Leo says, impact of keto on testosterone. I know MUFAs are good, meaning monounsaturated fatty acids, but is it enough? Leo, let me ask you this. Are carbohydrates required to create testosterone? I'll give you the answer. No, they're <laughs> not. Uh, you need saturated fats. Saturated fats are required. Monounsaturated fatty acids can be very beneficial for the body as well. Um, keto and testosterone, I don't think there would be a direct correlation. There's a thousand different, time, uh, different ways to formulate a ketogenic diet. There's a million different contexts within which this ketogenic diet could be formulated. So... If you've got major disruptions in your circadian rhythm, if you're working night shifts, if you're barely sleeping, if you're stressed all the time, if you're just if you're just full of envy and spite and hatred and fear, um, if you watch enough of the news, you're going to be in this constant state of feeling attacked, feeling oppressed, feeling absurdly shitty. Um, that's going to drop your testosterone level uh, level significantly. There's so many different things that affect your ability to create these sex hormones, your need for these sex hormones, um, and the thing, inflammatory processes will mar the production of these sex hormones. And um, if you've got elevated cortisol, elevated, um, I mean, if you've got major circadian rhythm disruptions, you're going to have elevated cortisol. You might have inverted cortisol. You're going to have funky hormone profile. Um, Keto in itself has never been shown to affect either negatively or positively uh, testosterone. Now, I mean, of course, like I enjoy a ketogenic diet, right? Like I, most of the clients I work with are on a ketogenic diet, and they see their testosterone levels jump, many of them. Now, is that because of keto? I don't think so. I think it's because they're cutting out a lot of crap in their diet, and they're lining up their lifestyle in a way um, – where they're lining up with their goals. You know, when you start to drop the inflammation from the body, which keto will be greatly beneficial in, uh, in doing, when you drop your inflammation levels, when you start to sleep better, when you correct your circadian rhythm, when you uh, work on your purpose in life, work on serving that purpose and living a, uh, a life that has meaning, an honest life where you're expressing yourself, you're going to benefit your hormonal profile significantly. So I think we tend to hyper-focus on diet, and anytime somebody changes their diet, they feel like they're looking through the world through the diet lens. I like to tell people, take that diet lens off. Look at the world through clean lenses or no lens. 
Remove those dogma lenses. Remove the dogma, the dogmatic lens that obscures your connection to reality, your connection to life, your uh, your clarity of focus. And uh, yeah, it's not all about just the diet. But a lot of people get really good benefits from keto for testosterone. And some people might see their testosterone drop on a ketogenic diet if they're all stressed out and then um, loopy. So it can go either way. Christopher Tedesco has got a question. Steam bagged veggies have two to three grams of sugar. Should I avoid them or am I fine? <laughs> all right, yeah, if you look at the macros of uh, broccoli or cucumber or any leafy green, there will be a few grams of so-called sugar. That's not white sugar. That's not saccharin. That's not uh, not saccharin. It's not uh, sucrose. It's not straight up table sugar. So uh, yeah, the, the few grams of carbohydrates in your vegetables are fine. There are natural sugars in most plant-based foods, and uh, nothing to worry about. Of course, if it's within your macros, right? If it fits your macros, if it fits your microwave diet. That's not what we're doing here, people. About nutrient-dense whole foods, about nourishing the body, about celebrating local whole organic foods, about foods and um, agricultural practices that are restorative, that don't destroy the topsoil, that don't destroy this beautiful world that we inhabit. Miriam Dominguez Reyes says, Hi, Tristan. Thanks for your videos. Helpful. In keto, trying to have my 1.5 grams protein per kilo. That's a good amount of protein, especially for a female. Well, I effing in a six to eight hour eating window, not easy to eat that much. Thoughts, tips, gracias. Yeah, look, you probably don't need that much protein. If you feel like you can't eat it, if it's hard to eat it, you might not need that much. But also, you're trying to lose body fat, right? Is that why you're doing keto? I mean, I'm, I'm assuming most people that are asking questions like this are probably looking to lose body fat. If your hunger is so low, this is a great thing. So you're eating the macros, which you believe is right for you, 1.5 grams of protein per kilogram. So if you weigh, now if that, you want to probably do that about your off your lean mass, right? So if you weigh, um, say if you're going for like 75 grams of protein, um, per day, and you're having trouble getting that in within a six-hour eating window. That means you're doing it right. <laughs> it means that your diet's so effective that even at the macros where you're losing body fat, you're not even hungry enough to finish those meals. You're like you feel like you're forcing it down. It's a good thing. So you might be able to cut back on the food a little bit. Might be able to cut back on the protein. Cut back on the fats. Maximize it. Strike when the iron is hot. If you're in that mode where you're not hungry. Hey, enjoy skipping some meals. But uh, the IF thing, just so you know, intermittent fasting. <sighs> intermittent fasting is not magic. There's no magic to eating within a six to eight hour eating window. A lot of females can find this pretty stressful too. So you might want to even drop the intermittent fasting, do three meals a day and see if that works, especially if you're just starting keto. But good job. Congratulations on the high level of satiety, the low hunger. That's perfect. We don't need as much food as we think. And when we become very energy efficient, we need even less food. So uh, not that you should be afraid of eating. You know, the food is bad. We need it to sustain this vessel, to sustain our body through which we interface with reality. Through with through which, I mean, this is our lens. This is what we experience life through. And uh, so we've got to treat it well. Don't deprive it and don't overfeed it overfeeding the flesh long term can have all kinds of negative consequences thanks Miriam thanks for the question Otis Dustin Brown says I've been on IF and ketogenic diet for about a month and my weight loss has stalled is this normal <laughs> um, that's not enough information for me to really like I mean are you eating you might be eating more food than you need you might be eating less food than you need I don't know and then also what is your stall right you say you stall what do you mean you stalled? Does that mean you haven't lost your scale hasn't moved in five days or a week? That's not a stall. 
<laughs> that's not a stall. One week of not losing a bunch of weight on the scale is not a stall. Um, this is why when I work with clients, I usually have us do waist measurements and body measurements as well as looking at the scale. The scale is not always accurate. You could be losing fat and gaining lean tissue. You could be losing fat but holding on to some water. You could be the same weight but you lost two inches on your waist. This happens all the time. So if your clothes are fitting looser, you're probably going in the right direction. Um, if you're not losing body fat, probably eating more food than you need to eat. And that's the case with a lot of individuals, especially because they've been told, eat as much fat as you want. As long as it's 80% of your diet, you're going to lose body fat, which is, like I said in the beginning of this hangout, fallacy. It's not true. It's simply not true. Energy balance does matter. So from the limited information you gave me there, that's what I would say. I'm getting, we're getting so many questions. There's so many people here. What's up? I got, I got William Stover, keto for a month, down 16 pounds. Congratulations, William. Good work, man. Keep it up. Isabel, need help to lose the last 8 to 10 pounds. 130. Can't pass that number. Those last 8 to 10 pounds can be difficult. But congratulations on getting there, Isabel. Um, you're going to have to look at everything you're doing, kind of comb through it, and uh, and tighten up the program there. So I don't know. I mean, that's <laughs> it's not enough information there, and I can't really give you a program here over the uh, over the Google Hangouts. But if you're looking for coaching, if you want to work with me one-on-one, -on -one, you can hit me up at primaledgehealth.com slash coaching. All right. Callie Youngstrom, do you think you can achieve fat loss on keto, eating higher calories than on a carb-focused diet? Uh, Context-dependent. Some individuals, perhaps. Hasn't been shown in any research yet. So maybe, could be the case, but there's no research to indicate, the, to indicate that. I, feel, I do feel like this, though, uh, Callie, I do think – that it's more difficult to gain body fat and to eat in a surplus on keto. And I think that even if you are eating in a surplus, you're less prone to storing significant amounts of body fat because of the low insulin levels. Now, I'm not a like not really sold on the whole insulin is the only thing, uh, the whole insulin hypothesis. I think this is very limited, right? It's very myopic. Just like, well, calories in, calories out. If you just tell people to uh, – to cut their calories, they lose weight. Well, yeah, you tell people to cut their calories. If you force them, if you deprive them of food, they will lose weight. But what happens when they have access to food again, when they're not in your metabolic ward study? you got to formulate a long-term approach that works for you long-term that you can maintain. You have to formulate, formulate a lifestyle. you got to get good at preparing the foods that you want to eat. You have to have a well-formulated diet. Um so yeah, I mean, anybody who's just starting now, if you guys are just joining us for the first time here, um, the ketogenic diet is not difficult to maintain long-term. It's very, very easy to maintain long-term, and that's why it works. It doesn't work because ketosis magically, magically makes you burn more body fat um, in a short period of time. Yes, it allows you to tap into body fat consistently. It allows you to fast for longer periods of time without feeling the negative effects of it. But energy balance still matters. You can lose body fat eating carbohydrates if you restrict calories, just like you can lose body fat eating high-fat diet while restricting calories. Now, like I said before, I'm not saying calories in, calories out is the totality of it. Uh, hormones play a huge role in this. Um, if you can establish a baseline habit, dietary habit, where you – through a low-carb diet, through a low-carb approach, through a ketogenic-style approach, um, you can formulate a, a, a diet and a habit, a baseline of habit that you can stick to long-term. Your satiety is going to be high and your hunger is going to be low long-term. You're going to have low insulin levels. You're going to have a hormonal profile that is more prone to allowing you to burn fat consistently. But that doesn't mean that you have to be in ketosis to burn fat. Right. Evan says, I did a lot of supplements with zero carb. 500 a month worth of supplements and vitamins. Yeah, that's interesting. So any any diet that requires a lot of supplements like that, I tend to ask myself, what's the point? Shouldn't we be getting these minerals and vitamins from our diet rather than having a supplement for with them? Magnesium, that's 
I mean, that one's, I mean, the soil is so depleted of magnesium and of many minerals that it makes sense to supplement with those. But, I mean, if you're having a supplement with all kinds of stuff to maintain a zero carb diet maybe it's not the greatest jake says so happy to have found your channel love the knowledge you are spreading made of the broccoli muffins they were bomb <laughs> jake what's up dude have you checked out the cookbook there's loads of other recipes in there man this is like a treasure trove of it we call it a uh we don't call it a cookbook we call it a training manual for ketogenic for low carb, ketogenic, and paleo cuisine, um, it's a training manual. It's more than just a cookbook. There's entire sections on how to use spices, how to use different spice combinations to bring out different flavors and textures and foods. Um, there's an entire section on using organ meats, how and why to include organ meats in the diet. Uh, we include Jessica's famous pemmican recipe, which is amazing. <laughs> pemmican is a really cool travel food. Um, Native American heritage foods has been around for thousands of years. There were wars fought over the pemmican trade. Um, uh, it's, it's just an incredible food. So, yeah, check out the Primal Edge Health. Uh, I'm sorry, the Primal – I'm sorry, the Ketogenic Edge Cookbook, and that's only available at PrimalEdgeHealth.com. Um, yeah, thanks for thanks for uh, the shout-out, Jake. For anybody who's wondering, that broccoli muffins recipe, we've got that on YouTube. It's also in the uh, Ketogenic Edge book. We've got several variations on that in, in the uh, Ketogenic Edge cookbook as well. Uh, my, my wife's shouting at me that that broccoli muffin recipe is actually not in the Ketogenic Edge cookbook. That's a free recipe that we put up on our YouTube channel, and it's going to be in her baked goods book, her forthcoming baked goods book, which should – it's just almost done. Uh, and it should be released in the next few months. So be looking out for – a keto baked goods book, a low carb, uh, gluten free baking book. That it's going to be <laughs> pretty off the charts. It's going to be pretty incredible. Um, but the ketogenic edge cookbook is groundbreaking. It's pretty much the quintessential ketogenic diet training manual for your kitchen that you can find. So uh, check that out. It's only available on our website. Thanks for the shout out, Jake. All right. So many people. All right. I'm trying to I'm scrolling down here to get some more questions. If I miss your questions, it doesn't mean I'm intentionally ignoring you guys. Uh, it's just uh, I can't get to all of them. There's a lot coming through. Jake says, do you ever utilize multi-day fasting or any type of flushing techniques to clean out the system, a.k.a. body spring cleaning? Uh, fasting can be a powerful tool. Fasting can be an incredibly powerful tool. I don't like how it's being marketed right now as like a fix-all, as something to be done for like vanity's sake. Um, that's... Kind of missing the point. I think if you're going to fast, it should be it's going to be a profound experience, and you should treat it respectfully. Just like if you're going to, it's it should be more of a spiritual experience, more of communion with the divine. I mean, you the fasting in every single um, esoteric tradition, religious tradition, in not only the West but in the East and the rest in the entire world, fasting is an incredibly profound. Um, practice that can help you enter into just mystical states of consciousness uh profound have profound healing experiences not just physical but emotional psychological um on like a spiritual level as well so i don't think that fasting should be done strictly for fun or because it's trendy uh yeah it's like it's kind of one of those things where i think it should be between you and between you and the creator, right? I mean, this is, it's like a sacred experience. Uh, it's, it's like when you take a, like plant medicines or whatever people call them nowadays. People use the term like entheogens, right? Uh, it's becoming really trendy again now too. Uh, it should be, it should be taken very seriously because um, there are potential dangers. You're playing with fire. Anytime you're messing with your consciousness like that and going into those profound states of experience, of intensity, um, you're playing with fire. It's not just physical fire. It's a metaphysical fire that you're playing with. 
So they have respect for what you're doing. And uh, be clear in your intention on why you're doing it. And fasting can be great. And I'm not promoting fasting, telling people to go start fasting. All right. Frank, what's up, Tristan? Big fan from Saipan CNMI. What is C Wow. Going on four weeks of keto. I learned a lot from your videos. Thanks, Frank. Keep it up, man. Yeah. Good work, man. Green Pastures 1000. U.S. commercial milk is full of antibiotics and pesticides. Totally. Commercial milk, filth. Unfortunately, most of our food supply is contaminated almost to the point of being weaponized. <laughs> All right. Abstract Death 7X. Whoa. What would be the best course of action to maintain strength on a fat loss keto diet? Keep lifting heavy weights. That's all you got to do. And I mean, the first couple of weeks, your strength will go down. You're starting keto. The first couple of weeks, you're losing a lot of water weight. Um, your glycogen levels are going to be depleted. Once you get through that and you start adapting, your strength will come back. So don't trip on it. Don't worry about it. Take it easy as you're going into it. But um, for long term, fat loss diet, keto style approach, uh, keep lifting those heavy weights and you will maintain strength and gain strength if you're doing it right. You're not eating it too much of a deficit and you're resting enough and recovering enough in between the workouts. All right. Evan says, do you listen to Dave Asprey, Tim Ferriss? Sometimes I'll listen to Evan, Tim Ferriss, Dave Asprey. Sometimes I'll have somebody that will that'll interest me. Uh, but not regularly. Uh, when they have somebody on with something that interests me, of course. Jackie says, thanks for peace to you and your family. Thank you, Jackie. Supernova says, hey, brother, good to see you. Good to see you, Supernova76. What's up, man? Man or woman? All right, here we go. He says, with magnesium tablets, they're basically useless. They just go through you. Well, yeah, if you're taking magnesium oxide, it's not digestible. Don't take magnesium oxide. Magnesium citrate can also be a laxative, but it doesn't just go right through you. You will absorb it. Magnesium glycinate, highly absorbable. Magnesium l 3 eight, highly absorbable, highly bioavailable. Magnesium, uh, magnesium chloride can be as well, um, and topical magnesium too. Carlos says, I just started, bro. This is my day four. And I've been feeling down with low energy. I think it's because I eat carbs more than anything before. I, uh, please let me know. Carlos, it's, it's in the beginning, it's hard, man. It's rough. It's a rough transition. I mean, you think about it. You're breaking a habit that you've had established for years, for decades maybe, depending on how old you are. Um, you've been eating a high-carbohydrate diet your whole life processed foods all these things when you start to take them out not only are you get like physical withdrawals kind of happen but there's like psychological things that happen as well um enjoy the newfound freedom from bondage to these habits and build sustainable healthy happy habits that you can move forward with and live with for the rest of your life um you know improve Improve the uh, the quality of foods that you're eating. Focus on nutrient density. Focus on making delicious meals. Get the Ketogenic Edge cookbook. Shout out to my wife. Shameless plug again for this awesome cookbook, which is available exclusively at primaledgehealth.com. Um, and start branching out. Become a keto master chef. Kind of master your kitchen. Um, don't don't just focus on the like the negative symptoms or whatever of the uh, you know, those first few days. Make sure you're getting electrolytes in. You probably aren't getting enough sodium. Increase your sodium and uh, make sure you're getting sufficient protein. You're not eating in too much of a deficit and you'll adapt. Leo says fiber is necessary for the gut bacteria. Uh, Leo, you can also get fibers from animal-based foods as well. You do know that, right? I mean, the collagen network and animals, if you eat the grisly bits, um, 
you're going to be getting significant amount of fiber and oligosaccharides and stuff like that that can feed beneficial bacteria um, as well. So you don't only get fiber from the plant world. There is animal fiber as well. A lot of people don't know that. Christopher says, since I'm poor, I can only afford store-bought things. Should I stay away from mayonnaise and steam pack veggies because of low sugars or am I fine? Hey, the, the packed veggies, as long as there's not added sugar, they're fine. When you're looking at those macros, the sugar, look at the ingredients too. If they're adding table sugar, which they're probably not for these packs of like steamed peas and stuff like that, you're fine, man. Um, mayonnaise, I would say go for a olive oil-based mayonnaise if you can or make your own mayo out of olive oil and eggs and vinegar and salt. Um, there's a recipe and instructions for making mayonnaise in the Ketogenic Edge cookbook. Check it out. So, uh, yeah, you can make your own high-quality mayonnaise and not have to worry about the, uh, the polyunsaturated fatty acids and the vegetable oils that are often put in there. Let's see. How long have we been going? We've been going for an hour already. Oh, the eyes get tired from staring at that screen. Oh, my mouth gets tired from flapping my gums. All right, Casey Godwin, what's up, Casey? Any tips for someone who cannot have dairy or eggs? Do you run the risk of not getting enough of some nutrients without these foods? Good question, Casey. Include organ meats in your diet. Liver, heart, even brain can be really good sources of fat-soluble vitamins. But uh, yeah, man, I mean, if you can't, Casey, if you can't eat uh, dairy, if you can't eat butter even, that's fine. Go for coconut oil. Uh, some people can tolerate ghee. You're not going to be missing out on any vital nutrients by not eating these foods. Now, Sometimes people have a sensitivity to something and then it clears up after healthy lifestyle interventions. You know, you correct your circadian rhythm, you decrease your inflammation. A lot of the time, these sensitivities go away. You're not locked into avoiding these foods forever and don't listen to anybody who tells you otherwise because it's just, it's not true. You're not locked into this diagnosis of, oh, I'm allergic to eggs. Um, some people are. I'm not saying, like, oh, if you're allergic to peanuts, go eat peanuts. That's, ridiculous that would be absurd don't do that <laughs> but just because you think you're sensitive to eggs right now you think you're super sensitive doesn't mean that you can't like have some later down the line once your body is in a better state but um yeah uh, branch out and use things like organ meats anything any recipe you find that's using butter just simply use coconut oil instead use more olive oil stuff like that um seafoods fish Things like uh, sardines, mackerel, uh, salmon. Eat these foods. Uh, broth, bone marrow, things like that. You can get lots of good nutrient-dense, um, lots of fat-soluble vitamins and nutrients. You're not going to get anywhere else from these foods. And even if you're not avoiding dairy and eggs, you should still be including these incredible foods like bone marrow, liver, heart. These are really good foods. Uh, and there's an entire section in the ketogenic edge cookbook all about it's called the odd bits section and it's all about using things oh here's here she is here she is with him look at that hey everybody look at that baby right there what's up buddy you're getting big we're just talking about your book oh that's sweet shilling your book nice i was talking about the uh the organ meat section this individual was saying she can't eat eggs she can't eat Butter even. No dairy. So Sam. That's Oregon a good meats. alternative, yeah. yeah. They're also super economical, so they're nice for families on a budget. You can source them out from local farmers, local farms in your area. Um, did you mention how you can grind up the heart and add it in with normal ground beef? You know, if you're just getting a taste for organ meats, that's a nice way you can sneak it in there. Yeah, do 50% heart, 50% ground beef. You just have your uh, your local butcher do that for you. Ground up, grind up a heart, mix it with your ground beef, and you can use the uh, the meatball recipe from the ketogenic edge cookbook. Have heart. You can also include a little bit of uh, of liver in there as well. Jessica makes pemmican with liver heart and muscle meat and that's an amazing uh, nutrient dense food with those fat soluble vitamins and the uh the vitamin a and these other things you're going to find in organ meats that you're not going to find elsewhere so check out the ketogenic edge cookbook broaden your horizons you're not stuck to just eating bacon and eggs there's a lot of different sources of protein and fat out there 
We also, we have a video up on YouTube from December, I think it was, where we discussed some of our favorite fats. Um, we went through the pantry here and filled the table with this whole oh, this spread. Way, so camera. Okay. This whole spread of, uh, what was it, like nuts, different oils that we use, cold pressed and uh, saturated fats like tallow and coconut oil. Um, we discussed... You guys, that's another source for you. Yeah. We discussed a lot about different fats. Yeah, so just you just got to find good foods that you can substitute for. There's nothing that you're going to be missing in butter. I mean, olive oil is an incredibly powerful substance as well. I mean, people get all hung up like, oh, got to eat so much grass-fed butter. Got to eat so much grass-fed butter. But look, I mean, the nutrient content of that butter, it's really not anything incredible. It'll have some CLA, which is really good, and uh, – you know, some vitamin K2 and vitamin D, depending on where it comes from. But there's nothing magical about butter that's just like giving you these amazing health benefits. It's mostly just a great source of saturated fat, of energy. So, um, yeah, use coconut oil. Use other other things. Got Ryder over here munching on the cup. <laughs> so cute. All right, let's see. Do you have a garden in your property? If so, what kind of veggies and fruit are you growing? I bet the soil is amazing on the mountainside. Jake, we do have a garden. The soil is not amazing. <laughs> it's kind of washed out. There's a lot of eucalyptus trees around that um, take a lot of the nutrition out of the soil, um, change the pH. The Andes here, they uh, turn over. There's a lot of rock slides uh, in the rainy season, and so the topsoil gets eroded by and you know whenever there's construction of the bulldozers come it's there's there's part of the property that's been flattened out so the it's it's like kind of the soil gets kind of washed out yeah. in the andes you know you get these rainy seasons where it just <laughs> rushes through and uh yeah and we've got a but decent we garden we got a bunch fertilizer. of veggies we got a bunch of veggies got some berries and stuff yeah. and we'll do another garden tour soon how about that we're working on some chicken stuff in there trying to put some chickens in the garden how important is drinking water? Very important. Drink water. <laughs> uh, will the microwave kill the nutrition in the food? No, but it'll mess with the structure of the water in the food, and it might lock up some nutrients. Uh, and it'll turn your cheese to plastic. And, uh, yeah, I don't, know. I don't use a microwave. I'm going to throw that thing away. Have you read Good Calories, Bad Calories by Gary Tobes? Destroys the calorie myth. Uh, very, very familiar with Gary Tobes. The calorie myth is not destroyed. Calories exist. Uh, calories count. But there's other things that influence our ability to adhere to lower calorie diets. And there's other things like hormones that greatly influence our ability to, uh, to have high satiety. So uh, I respect Gary Tobes, and he's got some good ideas, but I don't think he's got the whole picture there. I'm going to take the kids holler. down to the, the lunch Bye -bye. area. <laughs> I'm going to wrap this up too. All right. How many calories would you recommend a female consume on keto? I don't know. It depends on your goals. depends on what your caloric rate is. I can't just, like, there's no set amount of calories. Um, all right. Let's see. Scientific American exercise myth shows the metabolic burn from a couch potato is shown to be the same as those who are active. That's like such, that's such gibberish though, right? <laughs> Supernova, don't you think that's like, so what? Oh, well, they found that they burned just as many calories as couch potatoes. Um, that's, I mean, I don't know. That just sounds like word games to me. How to consume raw milk. I have easy access to organic raw milk. How should I drink it? Should I heat it or not? Oh, man, you're, you're lucky because most people in the U.S., Leo, don't have access to raw milk because the nanny state has told them that they need to pasteurize their food. Um, so it's illegal to sell raw milk in a lot of places, especially in the, uh, in the ridiculous place called California where I grew up. Uh, raw milk is illegal. But, yeah, I mean, just drink it, man. If you like raw milk, drink the raw milk. Uh, of course, if you're on a ketogenic diet, milk's not going to be a major part of the diet. You're not going to want to drink those, that lactose and those high sugar foods like milk. But um, you're just like on a lower carb diet or a um, balanced macronutrient intake. Raw milk is a fantastic food, in my opinion. 
<laughs> Casey says, I was afraid you are going to say organs. I'm trying to figure out how to get my kid over this problem. Her allergies are worse than mine, but low carb really helps her out. Yeah, get the ketogenic edge cook, but Casey, um, our daughter loves liver. Our daughter loves heart. She loves brain. It's all about what you how you prepare it and how you present it to your kid. Get them involved in making these foods. Tell them what they are. Tell them how delicious they are. Hey, what's up, Ariana? Here, show you. You like liver? What about heart? What are you eating right now? Banana. Show us the banana. Is that protein, carbs, or fat? <laughs> I don't know. She don't know. She doesn't care. Bye, Ari. Ariana's a great sister. She's out there looking after her brother. All right. <laughs> Mario De Leon says, talk about your fantastic maca. I talked about it, man. You got to rewind it. <laughs> I talked about maca earlier. I don't want to talk about it too much. I really like maca, though. Um, I don't know. I mean, you know what's a cool thing about maca? One of the cool little factoids about the history of maca is the ruling class of the Inca Empire made it let's say illegal and they had a different societal structure but it was illegal for the warrior class and for other individuals to consume maca outside of certain ceremonial settings because first of all the fertility increase could uh lead to uncontrolled population and we all know that it's so important to control an iron fist your population as you hear about on the news all the time population control is one of the main agendas of every governmental system um but uh, yeah, not only was a population control issue a thing, but also it would just make the men a little bit more virile and uh, a little bit less easy to control. So the Inca Empire actually reached the use of maca to strictly before battle <laughs> and other ceremonial uh, things. And of course, the high priests were consuming maca and chocolate and coca all the time. So the priesthood gets it, but the serfs were not allowed to consume it except in certain circumstances um but yeah i mean it, it's pretty incredible the way that maca first of all the way that it grows i mean not even grass grows where maca grows it thrives where no grass will grow trees won't grow up there it's above the grass line we're talking 12,000 15,000 feet where the air is so thin with such low oxygen levels that very few things can survive all right <laughs> Alberto's getting the book right now. Now I need time to read it. Alberto, check it out, man. You'll like it. Um, but oh yeah, so the individual asked about maca. Mario, there's a free maca ebook on our website. So if you want to learn about maca, learn about the history of it, how to use it, uh, what the heck is it, where does it come from, check out our ebook on our website. Um, I think it's actually if you look at the description of this video that you're watching right now, you'll see a link to a free ebook about maca. Um, a lot of tomfoolery out there in the market, uh, just like in the entire food, organic foods and uh, supplement market. Maca is not a supplement. It is a food. But um, because it's so sought after and so valued and valuable, there's a lot of uh, trickery that goes on. So much of the maca that gets exported from Peru, unfortunately, is contaminated with high levels of maltodextrin. How did that maltodextrin get in there? Well, producers found that it's cheaper <laughs> to sell maltodextrin and call it maca than it is to actually procure high-quality maca and sell it. So a lot of stuff is like 20 to 50 to even 75% maltodextrin. People put barley powder in there because it smells similar. People have even been putting wheat in the maca. And that sucks for people who are gluten intolerant, and that's something that really pisses me off. So I've been working in the export and import business of um, – for quite a while and i've seen all this stuff that goes on and it's absurd but the maca we've got i know it's 100 percent pure maca because we get it straight from the source we've been doing this for a long time so if you want real maca check out primaledgehealth.com so yeah thanks for the uh thanks for baiting me into talking about that jake says can't wait for the garden toy tour chickens are amazing for helping with the garden check out justin rhodes for some help with the chickens I will write that. Justin Rhodes. <laughs> All right. 
Right on. So it's been it's been over an hour. It's been like an hour and twenty minutes. If there's any last minute questions, um, I want to thank everybody for joining us. Thank everybody for the positive reviews on the Ketogenic Edge Cookbook, which is found exclusively at PrimalEdgeHealth.com. Um, we talked about a lot of things today. We talked about food prep, about getting kids to eat food. Um, maybe I'll go back to that. I can kind of finish out on that note. Uh, try to get your kids. Try to get your daughter for instance, to uh, to eat a healthy diet. It can be difficult, but the difficulty doesn't come from the kids being stubborn and from the kids. The difficulty is usually from us, the parents, right? We have to create this habit. We have to create this habit in our own lives in order to even pass it on to our kids. So first of all, we can't expect our kids to eat a healthy diet and to drop the lucky charms and stop eating the sugary crap all the time if we're not willing to do it ourselves. So for we're not pushing something on our kids that we're not willing to do ourselves. Um, and another thing is patience. Have patience with the kid. Have patience with yourself. Don't let yourself get overwhelmed one step at a time. Um, you know, removing things like foods with added sugar can be the first step. Then switching to, uh, you know, decreasing the intake of grains, gluten. For instance, if the child has gluten sensitivity, which is rampant nowadays, and gluten sensitivity in non-celiacs is very rampant, and gluten does cause an inflammatory response. That doesn't mean it's the cause of all these problems. I tend to think that the cause of the issue with gluten goes beyond just gluten because not as many people are affected in European countries. And you know what the difference is in these European countries? They aren't dousing everything with glyphosate. They aren't spraying carcinogenic, toxic, chelating antibiotics like glyphosate all over their food like it's water. But in the United States, that's what's been going on. And in much of the third world as well, where there's not a lot of education about how to use pesticides, where these lobbyists come in and they bully governments into allowing Monsanto to come wreak havoc on the economy and ecology of countries like Ecuador Colombia, to a lesser extent Peru, because Peru has banned Monsanto. Ecuador was supposed to ban all genetically modified seeds, but um, Presidente, Presidente Correa, who's going to have a nice cushy retirement in Belgium, uh, spent the last was like eight years, uh, no, six, eight years, completely selling out this country to uh, multinational corporations and the Chinese, while... Uh, just robbing his people of their resources, which is a shame. Um, I'm sorry, that was kind of a negative little rant there. <laughs> but anyways, gluten might not be the problem. If you're trying to get your kids to eat healthy, removing things like gluten and uh, including some non-grain-based foods. Like if you're, you could start doing baked goods with uh, coconut flour and stuff like that. Increasing healthy fats through. Um, Broth, you know, bone broth. Our daughter loves broth. It's all about finding the foods they like, finding some staple foods that they can consistently eat, and giving it to them when they're very hungry. Strike when the iron's hot, right? You don't try to give your kid food when they're not hungry and expect them to like it. Give them these new foods when they're actually hungry. Starve your child a bit. No, I'm just kidding. don't starve your child and give it to them when they're super, super hungry, but wait till they're hungry to give it to them. Um, Let's see what else. What are some other good tips? Leveraging. Very popular method in our household is just straight up leveraging foods. I've heard banana slugs are highly ketogenic, says Zach. You're funny. Banana slugs. Zach, Zach, Zach. I know who you are. See you, Zach. What's up, man? Banana slugs are highly ketogenic. Banana slugs are the, uh, the mascot of University of California. Santa Cruz, where Zach and I both attended um, a hotbed of, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, all right. Anyways, leverage foods, right? So if your kid likes something, like cheese, for instance, if your kid is human, your kid probably enjoys cheese. But if you can't have dairy, then this won't work for you. You know, if they're sensitive to dairy, which – why is your kid so sensitive to dairy? There might be a question to ask. What's going on in the environment that's creating this trigger-happy inflammatory response? But leveraging things like having some cheese and putting it on a food like liver, like fish, like fatty fish. Um, salmon is delicious. A lot of kids really like salmon. 
bake it, put some thyme, some lemon, some rosemary, some garlic, oregano, stuff on it. Make good meals and share it with your kid. Find staple foods that they enjoy. Leverage them with staple foods that they enjoy more. And um, take one step at a time and be patient with the kids. Don't just try and uh, beat it over their head. Don't make them afraid of food either. Don't put this like orthorexia program on them where it's like if they're going to eat wheat, you're giving them this look like they're doing, like they're cutting their wrists in front of you or something. Don't put that energy on your kid. That's irresponsible. Um, you know, just because we read something on the internet doesn't mean that it's true. Not everybody's allergic to gluten. It's not going to kill everybody. And um, there's different strokes for different folks, right? Like we don't keep these foods in our house for our daughter. We just keep around foods that we want her to eat. That's another very important strategy. Stock your cupboard with foods you want your kid to eat and don't keep foods you don't want them to eat. If you don't want them eating Oreos, you better not be eating Oreos behind their back. You know? So, uh, yeah, there's so, so many ways to, uh, to get those good foods in the kid's diet. Leveraging, I think, might be the most powerful technique. Leverage with a banana. <laughs> Leverage with anything, anything they'll eat. If you want to eat this, First, you gotta finish this. Eat your broccoli and your <laughs> cod livers, or your uh, your broccoli and your eggs and liver, and then you can eat your fill in the blank. Hopefully, not Captain Crunch or Lucky Charms. What I grew up on. All right. I think that's it, everybody. It's two twenty-five here. I'm tired of staring at the computer, and it's time for us to all get on with our lives, and for me to eat some food. <laughs> So, I want to thank everybody for joining us. It's been fun. Thanks for all the questions, guys. Zach A., I'm pretty sure I know which Zach this is. I hope that's you. I hope you're doing well, buddy. Um, it's been a long time. It's been a long time since Santa Cruz, right? 2005. Crazy. How much the world has changed. I remember, Zach, you're one of the people who introduced me to YouTube. Here I am talking to you through YouTube. What a paradox. <laughs> okay, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, you can find more at PrimalEdgeHealth.com. The Ketogenic Edge Cookbook mentioned is available exclusively at PrimalEdgeHealth.com. The Ketogenic Edge Cookbook, a training manual for low-carb ketogenic and paleo cuisine, is available exclusively on our website in ebook format. Um, I, mean, I can't praise my wife enough for the job she did on that book it's absolutely incredible um the reviews have been incredibly positive nothing but positive reviews in fact um it's just you know we're so grateful that you guys enjoy it so grateful that we can share this with you basically we put together the book that we would have wanted when we started out keto she made the book the cookbook that she wanted for her kitchen she references it almost every day still so um Thanks for joining. You can find us at PrimalEdgeHealth.com. If you want to be informed about the next live Q&A, the next live hangout that we're going to do, um, sign up for the newsletter on our website on PrimalEdgeHealth.com. Join the conversation with us on the newsletter. We don't send it. We haven't been sending it out as often as we'd like. We're going to start sending out more content via the newsletter and uh, really deepen and improve that dialogue with you guys. So, Thanks for joining. You can find us on Facebook as well, Primal Edge Health. You can find us on Instagram, Primal Edge Health, if you want some ideas for um, healthy kids' foods. Which, uh, Jessica's always putting stuff up on our Instagram with uh, kid-friendly recipes and whatnot. And look out for the book that I was talking about earlier, the Baked Goods book, the forthcoming Baked Goods book. Uh, you guys are going to be blown away by this one. It's going to be unlike anything else that's out there. Very comprehensive as well. I think there's over 100 recipes. So, uh, all right, everybody. Evan, Zach, Christiana, Forrest, Ilya, Elmia, and everybody who's talking today. Thank you for joining. Thank you for the questions. Thank you for the support. Thank you for enjoying the content. And we'll see you guys next time. Have a fantastic rest of your day and an amazing week and an amazing life. And uh, remember, it's a choice. It's a choice to be here. It's a choice to grow. It's a choice to drop our old dogma and to move forward with habits that promote life. So, um, yeah, focus on that which builds life. Speak that which builds life. 
and enjoy the life that you're blessed with because you never know when it's going to go. So I'll see you guys next time. You can find us more at PrimalEdgeHealth.com. Signing out from the Andes of Ecuador where when I look out the window right now, I see sunshine blasting on the trees and I hear rain tickling my roof. So we got sunshine and rain at the same time. I love it when it does this. Signing out from the middle of nowhere in the Ecuadorian Andes. PrimalEdgeHealth.com. See you guys next time.